word this morning. All right, if you got your Bibles with you, you can turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And we're going to pick up in verse 10. I'm going to read a pretty big portion of scripture here, but it's really going to set the stage for what we're wanting to talk about and what is on God's heart to talk about today. This is, this is Saul. Uh, we know him as Paul, who has wrote the majority of the New Testament, but here is really the salvation moment, the life-changing, transformational moment of Saul's life. Here we go in verse 10. Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias, yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I've shown him in a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you may, might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is indeed the Son of God. The title of my message today is Transformed by the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this moment, Lord, and we just declare that your word is active, it's living, it's sharper than a double-edged sword, and God, we just say that this is your time. And Lord, I pray that you would anoint my words and my lips today to speak your word. And Lord, I pray over every single heart, every single per person that you've called to a purpose in their life, Lord, would you speak to us and would you transform us in the name of Jesus? Amen. Amen. So here we have this story where we have Saul, who was actually a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. And one thing you need to know about the religious leaders is if you were going to be a Pharisee, you had to memorize the whole Torah. If you don't know what the Torah is, that's the first five books of the Bible. Now, in your, if you've ever done a, a, a yearly reading program or something like that, who knows it's sometimes hard just to read the whole, the whole Torah straight through. <laughs> I know I'm right there. We call it the mountains of Leviticus. <laughs> you got to climb them. You got to get to the top and conquer it. But what these guys could do, not only did they have to memorize the whole Torah, the whole five, first five books of the Bible, you could actually take a nail and put it through the Torah. And these Pharisees could tell you every single verse that the nail was through. This, this is before Saul's conversion. And it just goes to show you, you can know a lot about God, but not serve God. You can know a lot about what it is to follow God or what is right and what is wrong, but you can actually be working against the movement of the Holy Spirit and you can be working against the movement of Jesus. So Jesus confront Saul. He's riding a horse and he gets knocked off his horse. And what does Jesus say? He says, Saul, it's me, the one you're persecuting. You can believe in Jesus and you can know a lot about Jesus, but you can actually be working against the momentum of Jesus in, in, his, in your life. 
So here we have, we have Paul, and there is this huge, massive transformation moment, and he is actually blinded. And I can only imagine in this moment where Saul is blinded because there was a physical manifestation of something that was happening in his spirit. He thought he was seeing very clearly, and he thought he was seeing things enough to even persecute Christians, believers, but he couldn't see it all. In fact, Saul was the guy who authorized the murder of Christians. I'm telling you, if there's any hope for you, if you're thinking, man, I've done too many bad things, I've done, I don't know if God can use me, look no further than Saul. Because this guy was so full of hatred towards anyone that called on the way, on the way of Jesus, that he authorized the murder of Christians. In fact, Stephen, the church's very first martyr, the Bible says that everyone that was going to stone Stephen, they were going to kill him. They took off their coats and laid them at Saul's feet. Now, what does that mean? Why do they take the coats off? Well, they took the coats off, number one, because they wanted to throw the stones even harder. They wanted to make sure and get a good stone's throw at this person. And then this was a very, very bloody ordeal, so they didn't want to get their blood on their clothes, and Saul was the guy they laid their garments at so they could do this. And he loved it. Listen, I don't care what you have done. Jesus can transform your life. Jesus can transform your life. And when you yield to God's plan for your life and you yield to the Holy Spirit, what happens is Ananias comes in. He comes in and he prays for him and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happens? The scales fall off. When you receive the Holy Spirit in fullness and receive Jesus in fullness, what happens is, is you actually begin to think about life and look about, look at life a lot differently. We need the Holy Spirit and transformation happens with the Holy Spirit. So today I'm going to give you two areas in which the Holy Spirit will transform your life if you let him. Now, um, I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer is, is there, are, uh, there are limitations to the Holy Spirit. The limitations are the, are the limitations that you put on the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is like a gentleman. He doesn't force his way into your life. He doesn't demand his way into your life. He looks for someone that is open and willing to say, Holy Spirit, I want you in my life. So what I'm about to say and what I'm about to preach, it's not like, hey, I'm going to pray one prayer at Legacy Hills Church and my whole life is going to change because I said, Holy Spirit, I want you. We need to say every single day, Holy Spirit, Jesus, I'm following you. Okay. The first area is character. Your character. Now, in order to understand the work of the Holy Spirit, we need to understand the mission of Jesus. Jesus, his mission was to die. His mission was to come to earth, live a perfect life, and die for the sins of the world and be raised again. Now, Jesus, when he had his disciples, he said something absolutely shocking to his disciples because he began talking to his disciples about the Holy Spirit, and he says this. He says, it's better for me to go because who is going to come? Imagine being a disciple. Imagine walking with Jesus, seeing Jesus seeing the miracles, seeing all these different things, seeing the crowds, seeing the messages and being a disciple and looking Jesus in the eyes and saying, how could that possibly be that it would be better for you not to be here? Well, here's the truth about Jesus is Jesus, though he was fully God and fully man, he could only be in one place at one time. 
He was limited actually to a physical body. But he said the Holy Spirit is going to come and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is gonna be with you and you and you and you wherever you go in every single country for anyone that is willing to go and follow him. See, that's why we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to minister to us what Jesus would minister to us in our moments, in our lives, when we need it. He is there to walk with you. He is there to encourage you. He is there to strengthen you. He is there to be there in the darkest hour of your life to strengthen you. And so the mission of Jesus was to die, but the Holy Spirit is here to work with you. And what does he do? He works on our character. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, he, convi- he convicts the world of sin. That's his job. Is he convicts our, the world of sin, and that's ultimately what leads us to Jesus, right? Because we know we need a Savior. I don't know about you, but if, if you, I remember when I first gave my life to Christ, I was an absolute mess. I was addicted. I was immoral. I actually played poker for a living for five years and lived in Vegas and had a very, very crazy, crazy lifestyle. And I remember, let me tell you something. I remember when I realized just how broken and how lost and how sinful I was. I knew it and I fought it, but the Holy Spirit was there to remind me. And let me tell you something, 10 years later, 11 years later, I am glad the Holy Spirit convicted me of the very thing that was killing me. But the Holy Spirit is there to convict us of what the very things in our life is actually killing us. See, the Holy Spirit's role is not just to be domineering and tell you everything you need to do. The Holy Spirit is there to purge the very things out of your life that don't need to be there that are leading to death. See, John 10, 10 says, it says the thief, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I, Jesus, have come to give life. And so the Holy Spirit hates sin because sin hurts you and it hurts other people. It's not that the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to have fun. The Holy Spirit, in fact, is very fun. Get filled with the Holy Spirit and just see how fun it is. Because there's nothing like the filling of the Holy Spirit. But he builds our character. I want to show you the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. This is what the fruit of living a life of the Holy Spirit looks like. This is it. Every tree has has fruit and it's known by its fruit. Let me show you the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And first, let me show you this fruit of the, of the flesh. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh, that's us, that's our sinful nature, are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now here is the fruit of the spirit. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So we have the fruit of the flesh. That's our sinful nature. Then we have the fruit of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is there in every single moment to make sure that we're producing the right fruit. See, when we understand in our lives, one thing we do in our home is we actually correct based on the fruit of the Spirit. Is we say, okay, that, that wasn't loving. That, that wasn't, Jen, I, have, I have three girls, seven, five, and one. So we're, we're all up in this thing right now. 
I mean, guys, I've done the, I've done the wildest things as a parent, just try, trying to get breakthrough in my life. I have literally anointed a toilet with oil during potty training saying, Holy Spirit, come, we need your help. God, I need breakthrough right now. But we actually, <laughs> I did anoint the toilet. I'm not, that's not just a joke. I didn't put that, I, that actually happened. We've done all kinds of things because we want the fruit of the Spirit in our life, and that's funny. But we, we actually correct based on those things because here's the thing. Imagine your life full of the fruit of the Spirit. Imagine your marriage full of the fruit of the Spirit. Imagine your relationships full of the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to produce the right kind of fruit. And the, the Holy Spirit, it's like there, like, like husbands. But before we say something really, really stupid to our wives, the Holy Spirit is there. <laughs> and so many times I'm like, I'm going to say it. I don't even care the consequences. I'm saying it and I'm dealing with it. Well, no, the Holy Spirit is there. Before we do something that is not smart, before we do something that is going to hurt us, that's going to hurt others, the Holy Spirit is there to build in character. And I'm telling you right now, God is not a God who will have you compromise your character to get certain outcomes in your life. You can be successful in business. You can be successful in your marriage. You can be successful in the marketplace. You can be successful with things without uh, sacrificing the integrity and the character in your heart. Number two is the supernatural. He develops the supernatural in our life. Now, many times when, if you've ever heard someone say, hey, this person is Christ-like. Pastor Jade is Christ-like. Generally, we think of character, which is true. Jesus had perfect character. He dealt with every situation perfectly. But one thing Jesus was, is he was full on supernatural. Jesus was full of miracles. He was full of power. He was full of healings. He had prophetic words from heaven. He spoke to the future. Jesus was full on supernatural. And everything in us, we actually desire the supernatural. And I want to start before I even get into the supernatural side of, of our lives, the supernatural side of the Holy Spirit. And it is amazing and it is incredible. But before I get into it, I actually felt in my preparation time to expose two counterfeits of the Holy Spirit. Two counterfeits of the Holy Spirit. See, the enemy, the devil, he's not creative. He only perverts and distorts what God has made. He takes something that's good, perverts it, and then tempts you to the very thing that will kill you. Here's number one. New age spirituality. Colossians 2 verse 8 says this. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Here's what the new age does. The new age pulls on a person's God-given desire for God and the supernatural and twists it into spiritual bondage and rebellion to God. The new age says, find your own spirit and then control your life. The Bible says, lose your life, follow Jesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you will find your life. The new age says you are the center of your world. The Holy Spirit puts the mission in Jesus and the love of Jesus at the center of your world. The new age promises to bring you peace, but God is the only real prince of peace and the only one who can bring real peace. The new age believes all gods are the same and that Jesus was only enlightened. But the Bible says there is one true God and Jesus is the perfect, blameless, spotless son of God. There is one God. There is one real, true Holy Spirit and it is the Holy Spirit. 
And if you've been wrapped up in the new age in that thinking and it so easily seeps in and it so easily entangles us because it, it can feel so good and it can feel so right and it can promise something, but it only leads into death. We need to be careful of any spiritual experience that's not centered on Christ. We need to be very, very careful. We need to steward what we, what we're watching. We need to steward what we're listening to because there's these different things that try and come in and contaminate our life. Number two, I believe drugs and alcohol are a counterfeit to the spirit-filled life. Now, I'll give a disclaimer because I know what you're already going to say. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for a while. You say, well, Jesus drank wine, okay? And that is true. Also, I can, I can just hear it. I can hear it right now. Jesus drank wine, but historians also say that it took 22 to 23 glasses of wine back in that day to even equal one glass of wine. Okay, so what I, when I'm speaking of alcohol and drugs, I'm speaking of being under the influence of something. I'm speaking of a, 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 a type of... Uh, a type of atmosphere that we would set, that we would put in our bodies as a substance that would try and mimic the Holy Spirit and the joy that God has for us. But let me tell you something about how this is a counterfeit to our lives. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Let me ask you this. How many lives do you personally know that's been ruined by drugs or alcohol? I know many. You may have a father, you may have a son, you may have a relative, you may have a long line of family members. I have family members. Many of my uncles didn't make it past the age of 50 because they were so drunk, so intoxicated, and they destroyed their bodies. I actually, personally, and I'm not, I'm not putting this on anyone. I made a decision earlier this year, and this is, I promise you, this is not a holier-than-thou moment. I actually chose to, to, not, to not drink at all. Because I have seen so many spiritual leaders fall and create terrible, terrible atmospheres for their churches because of alcohol. And the other thing is, is I just don't need any more temptation than I already have. <laughs> I don't need any more. And if you're just someone that's been struggling with this area, you can just look at me and say, okay, Pastor Neil doesn't drink at all. I'm going to make a decision. I'm not going to drink at all. I'm not putting that on you. But you may need a season of that. And let me tell you something. I was addicted to drugs and alcohol. Okay? So, so I, this was something that, that I know very, very well. And I just, at some point, I didn't want to deal with that anymore. I wasn't getting drunk. I wasn't doing these different things. It's just like, hey, I, I, I just want to make sure that I'm putting barriers up in my life that don't give the, the enemy an opportunity to attack me. But here is how the alcohol and substance abuse can mimic the Holy Spirit. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, often the last thing you want to do is get drunk because the Holy Spirit is the new wine. When you get alcohol in your system, you lose control. When you get the Holy Spirit in your life, you get self-control. When you get substances in your body, it does damage to your body. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it brings healing to your body. Substances are used to bring temporary relief and happiness, but the Holy Spirit brings eternal solutions to your hurts, your pains, and your wounds. Substances are used to lower inhibitions, lower fear, and societal anxiety. The Holy Spirit creates freedom in your life, removes the fear of man, and makes you bold. Now, I want to just say again, no matter how deep you are in something like this, there is freedom for you. There is absolutely, if you, if you are in here, and, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to change the message for anyone, but I will go over above and beyond to say, listen, if there's any struggle in your life, Jesus loves you. If there's any issue in your life, if there is any addiction in your life, take this person 
right here, Neil Seward, I was addicted for years and years and years and years, and my life was a mess because of it. I was popping pills, I was injecting myself, I was drinking, I lived, I lived a very, very immoral lifestyle, and I just wanna say, not only is there a way out, a life with God and the Holy Spirit is 100 times better. It's 100 times better. The supernatural, the supernatural, getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And I know there's oftentimes, we come from many, many church backgrounds. Some of you may have came from, from a church that there, there, was no, there was no speaking about the Holy Spirit. There wasn't the gifts talk, talked about. Um, some of you may have come from churches where there was actually abuse happening and it was in the name of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to say, that is so wrong. If you're a person who's been on the wrong side of spiritual abuse in the name of Holy Spirit, let me just tell you something, that is not God's heart. That is not God's heart. But we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, do we? You know, when we get food poisoning or something at a restaurant, it's not like, hey, I'm never eating out again. <laughs> it's like, I'm just going to find another restaurant. When we have a bad experience somewhere or a friend or we have a, a, a friend or a relationship, it's not like, I'm never going to talk to anybody. I'm never going to do anything. No, no, no. We need to get healing for those things. And it only comes from Jesus and move forward into our life. And I'll just say Legacy Hills Church is not a perfect church. But we invite the Holy Spirit, and it's never our heart to abuse anything. We want to be a healthy place. We want to be a whole place. And we want to keep love at the center of these things. But spirit-filled boldness. I want to talk about spirit-filled boldness. Boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit. And we could do a whole series. We could spend a whole year. But these are the two things that I felt led to spend some time on with boldness. Now, let me tell you something about the boldness, the supernatural boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's not necessarily loud. It's not necessarily in your face, and it's definitely not angry. A boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit is humble and strong. It's humble and it's strong. It's not loud. It's not, it's not controlling. It's knowing exactly who I am in Christ and who I am in God. Let's take, for example, Stephen, the very first martyr. Stephen was getting ready to get stoned after full love in his heart, preaching the gospel hoping that people come into the light of Jesus Christ. Love filled in his heart, knowing that he is about to give his life for Jesus. He counted the cost. He was following Jesus. He did exactly what God was leading him to do, and he was getting ready to be martyred. Now, what he didn't do is point his finger at everybody and say, you guys are the most evil, terrible person. I can't believe this. I'm glad I'm dying because I can't even be in your presence anymore. It wasn't emotion. See, there's a lot of emotion in the world today. And it's about to increase because we're about to come into another presidential election cycle coming up. Do you guys feel it already? Do you feel Just raise your hand if you feel it. I feel it. Now, we can react emotionally and in our flesh with things, but God wants us to respond in a humble, strong way. We want to stand firm on the word of God. We want to call sin, sin. We want to call love, love. We want to call male, male. We want to call female, female. We want to call truth, truth. But if there's a little bit of harshness in it, I would say that not is, is not fully the Holy Spirit. See, what we need to do is allow God to sanctify us enough to the fact where we're not getting involved in these emotional, heightened games 
that the world plays. See, there's a spirit of the world. And then there's the Holy Spirit. There is the Holy Spirit that causes us to respond to these different things. And so Stephen is here and he's getting ready to get martyred. And what does he say? He says, Father, forgive them for what they're doing. Just like Jesus. See, there is a love so great for people that you will not get outside of the Holy Spirit. You, you can't get that from the flesh. Only from the Holy Spirit, when you're ready to get martyred or killed or you're getting persecuted or you're getting yelled at or even if you're getting cut off at the light and you want to tell someone they're number one with the wrong finger. There's a proper response to that. And the Holy Spirit is there to stay strong, stay bold, stay under control, and stay full of God. See, the Holy Spirit actually helps you respond to situations like Jesus would help you respond to situations. Just like Jesus would we'll never be perfect, but he helps us respond. The second dimension of the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to get into miracles and healings and all that stuff. Today. By the way, if you need a miracle in your life, if you need healing in your body, our prayer team is going to come up after service. We want to pray for you because we believe in all that, but I don't have enough time in the day uh, to do that. And you guys have things to do later. But the number two thing I felt led to share today is the power to endure. See, God doesn't promise us that life is going to be easy. There's many, many great promises in the Bible. Many, many great things that we can hold on to, but there's not one that promises life would be easy. If someone told you that your life is going to get amazing and great and awesome when you give your life to Christ, I just want to formally apologize for that because that's not how it works. We have God with us in the middle of living in a fallen and broken world. And in the worst day of your life, in the worst season of your life, in the midst of losing a job, in the midst of uh, finding out a diagnosis from the doctor and losing a family member, all those different things, it doesn't take the pain away, but it gives you the ability to endure like Jesus would endure. See, the world would tell you that you're on your own. The Holy Spirit would tell you, I've got you, I'm with you, and I'm standing with you in this situation, and I'm going to give you every bit of comfort, every, bit of, every, every single bit of strength that you need to get through this situation. And I just even sense in my heart that there are some very, very painful, difficult situations representing in this room. It doesn't take a prophet to know that. This is life we're living but can I tell you that the Holy Spirit is there and he's with you and he's waiting for you if you haven't already opened up your heart to him to help you in that situation. See, how does James in James chapter one say, count it all joy when we endure various trials? Because God is working the long game. He sees the end from the beginning and he helps us and gives us strength and it produces character and endurance in our life. The Holy Spirit is there. But I really believe the Holy Spirit wants you to know, maybe you feel, maybe you're in here and you feel intimidated by following God. You, you, just, you just don't know what to do. I've been there. Where you just don't know what to do. This whole following Jesus thing seems overwhelming. It seems like so much. You don't know where to start. You don't know what to do. You just know you're a mess and you know you're broken or you're in the midst of a situation that there is no sight of getting out of that situation. But let me tell you this. The Holy Spirit is with you. And all you need to do is ask him for the boldness to do the next step. See, we follow Jesus not in leaps. We follow him in steps. And sometimes we take a step with God and it feels like a leap, but God is only asking every single person in this room, what is your next step? 
What is the next thing of obedience that God is calling you to do? Listen, whatever it is, it's going to take some boldness. It's going to take some encouragement. It's going to take some strength. And God is going to meet with you and give you what you need. But he's waiting for you to ask, Holy Spirit, will you come in my life? Will you give me boldness? I want to follow you in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? I want to give every single person an opportunity in this room. Maybe you're in this room and worship team can come up. Maybe you're in this room and, and you, you haven't yet given your life to God. This is a very good day to do that. It'll be the de- best decision of your life. Maybe you just need to take the step of, of making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. It'll be the best decision of your life. But maybe you're in this room and say, hey, I've never, I've never invited the Holy Spirit into my life. This is new for me, but I want all that God has for me. And I'm signing up and saying, God, would you, would you do something in my life? Would you fill me with your spirit? And here's the thing. Sometimes you hear stories of this crazy thing happened at a concert or you're flipping through YouTube channels and you're seeing some crazy looking experience almost. But here's the thing, the Holy Spirit approaches you in a way that you can receive it. If Jesus came to you and offered you the Holy Spirit, he would approach you in a way that he knew that you could receive him in. Listen, there is no fear with the Holy Spirit. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and the sound mind. And right now, I just want you to close your eyes right where you are. Thank you, Jesus. And right now, if you're saying, I I want that. I I want the Holy Spirit in my life. I need boldness. I need strength. I need a miracle in my life. I need God. And I want God. I I want you to have all of me. I want that. Right where you are, would you just lift your hands right now? Awesome. I see hands going up all over the place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If we can just get some volume on the keys, that'd be great. Thank you, guys. Father, right now, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, over every single person right now. And Father, I pray for the filling of your Holy Spirit. I pray, God, we pray that you would develop our character. We pray that you would uh, form the supernatural in our life, God. We want more of you. We want the power of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, God, we declare that we cannot do it without you. Lord, I pray over every single person in the name of Jesus right now that is lost, that is broken, that is hurting, just like you changed the name from Saul to Paul. God, you can change their name from broken, lost, hurting, depressed, suicidal, fearful, anxious, into a saint, into a follower, into forgiven, into healed, into filled with power. Father, I pray over every single person, Lord, we want you. This is your moment. This is your time to come and fill us. And I pray that you would fill every bit of hunger in this room, knowing that you are with us, with the power to endure, with the power to form us and shape us into everything that you've made us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.